ZBrush has been used in the industry for years. You will find it behind characters in video games, detailed creatures in movies, and many other commercial projects. It is basically a staple in pipelines where high-resolution sculpting matters. But if you've ever tried picking it on your own, there is a good chance you will experience a feeling of counterintuitiveness right out of the gate. And you're not alone. Many people give up before they even start, and they get comfortable learning the basics. This isn't because ZBrush is broken or updated. In fact, this is because it was built differently from most other 3D software. And that difference shows up at every step, from how you start a project to how you move around the interface. The learning curve starts the moment you launch ZBrush. Unlike Blender, Maya, or Max, you are not dropped into a clean scene with a camera or a cube. Instead, you get a canvas and a tool, which in ZBrush just means a 3D mesh that you can work on. The problem is, if you click once and don't enter edit mode, that mesh is instantly turned into a 2D image. It looks like 3D, but it won't respond to sculpting or navigating anymore. That's usually where people hit their first wall, but it is just how the software behaves by default. On top of that, ZBrush doesn't deal with objects the way other 3D apps do. You will use the subtools instead, which are basically separate parts of your model that can be edited independently. It works fine once you understand it, but the terminology and structure are unfamiliar, especially if you are coming from a traditional modeling background. Then there is the UI which is a dense mix of floating menus and drop-downs that don't follow the typical tab-based layout. It is actually packed with options, but many aren't labeled clearly, and the icons can be hard to understand. So even before you start sculpting, just figuring out what everything does can be a slow process. Once you start moving around and sculpting, the interface keeps throwing curveballs, so navigation doesn't behave the way most 3D artists expect, for example zooming. It doesn't adjust the viewport camera like in Blender or Maya. Instead, it scans the models visually on the canvas. You are not actually moving through the space. You are resizing what you can see. And this can mess with your sense of depth and scale. And it affects how brushes behave as well. A brush might suddenly feel too big or too small. Not because the brush changed, but because your view of the model did. Padding and rotating the view also rely on precise mouse and pen movements combined with key presses. The logic is different enough that it often trips up new users. Tablet users especially tend to struggle with fluid control early on, since slight slips in pressure or cursor position can completely change what the viewport does. Saving your work is also more complicated than it should be, because ZBrush gives you three ways to save, as a tool, as a project, or as a document. Each one saves different parts of your work. Save it the wrong way, say as a document, and you might open your file later on to find your sculpt missing. It is not always obvious which one to use, unless you already know the system. And because there is no scene outlier like in other DCC software, you can't just glance at your full setup. For complex models with multiple parts, this makes managing your scene harder than it actually needs to be. Even basic navigation in ZBrush takes time to get used to. The way you pan, zoom, and rotate the view isn't just different. It just changes depending on your cursor's position and what key you are pressing. If you are holding Alt to rotate and let go of it in mid-drag, ZBrush switches to panning. If your cursor is over a UI element instead of the canvas, your controls stop working the way you expect. But there is a rhythm to it that you will learn over time. But until then, it can lead to misclicks and confusion. Selection and visibility tools also depend heavily on shortcuts and subtle clicks, often without any visual feedback. If a brush stops working, it might be due to a model toggle, or maybe hidden geometry or incorrect scale. And figuring out what's wrong often means hunting through menus or resetting your setup. And none of this is unfixable, but it adds friction at every stage, especially when you're still getting comfortable. Once you've gotten used to the interface, the next challenge is figuring out which tools to use. The ZBrush is packed with them. Over 200 sculpting brushes, 
In addition to multiple methods for creating base shapes like Z-spheres, Dynamesh, or imported meshes. This sounds great on paper, but it is easy to get overwhelmed. There is actually no clear direction, especially for beginners, and you're not guided toward a logical starting point. You're just dropped into a giant toolbox without labels. Every brush comes with options for stroke type, alpha texture, fallout curves, and more, all of which can interact with subtle ways. It's not hard to change a setting accidentally, and then wonder why the brush is acting weird. And unless you know where to reset things, you can waste time troubleshooting something simple. Most beginners stick with a few brushes, like Move, Damn Standard, Clay Build Up, and so on, because they are reliable and easy to understand. As an artist said, you can achieve a lot in ZBrush with just basic tools, like Move, Damn Standard, Clay Build Up, and so on. There are many tools in ZBrush that make it seem daunting, but that doesn't mean you can't achieve stuff with just basic knowledge. This is actually a good advice. You don't need to master every button in one day, because the better approach is to start small, repeat what works, and grow your skills from there. Another reason ZBrush feels unfamiliar is the sculpting first workflow. In most 3D software, you start with clean topology, a poly meshes with good edge flow, which are ready to subdivide. In ZBrush, it is the opposite. You begin with form and volume, sculpting freely with high resolution geometry, and once the shape is defined, you use tools like Z Remesher or Manual Retopo to clean up the mesh. For 3D artists coming from Maya, Blender, or Max, this feels actually backwards. You're not building with loops or planning for deformation, you're just shaping clay. This works well when it comes to speed and stuff like concepting, but this means you will need to let go of some best practices from traditional modeling. And if no one tells you when to use Dynamesh, when to stop subdividing, or when to retopologize, you will likely get stuck trying to solve problems the wrong way. The tools to fix these issues exist, but they require experience to use properly, and they come with their own learning curves too. This sculpting first mindset especially impacts anatomy. ZBrush lets you jump into high res details from the start, but if you don't know your anatomy, it is hard to make sense of what you are building. Software doesn't offer structure or guidance on where to begin. This is the case because it expects you to understand proportions, form, and anatomy on your own. So while the brushes give you full control, that control can quickly lead to mistakes if you are not sure what you are doing, just like real sculpting. It is easy to get caught up in detailing muscles or skin folds before the underlying forms are even working. That's why a lot of beginners actually struggle when working on anatomy, because they can be too detailed. ZBrush won't stop you from going in the wrong direction, so it is your own study of anatomy and developing a sculpting workflow and knowing how to prioritize structure before detail that can actually help you get a good result. A lot of the frustration comes from expecting ZBrush to be a full 3D package, because it's not. It is a sculpting tool, a really good one, I might add. And while it has tools for modeling, texturing, and even some rendering, it is not built to handle rigging, animation, or final production on its own. So if you are trying to use it like Blender or Maya, you're gonna hit some limitations. The better approach, I think, is to treat ZBrush as a tool in your pipeline. Use it for sculpting, then export your mesh to another app for topology, UVs, animation, or rendering. Once you understand that, ZBrush becomes easier to work with. It is not about doing everything, it is about doing one thing really well. Add to this the fact that it lacks built-in guidance. ZBrush doesn't offer an onboarding system, pop-up hints, or tutorials inside the software, like for example the navigation tutorials in Maya or the pop-ups bars in Blender. If something breaks, it won't tell you why. This means your learning process depends heavily on external resources, but fortunately, the community is strong. You have YouTube tutorials, forum threads, and courses everywhere. Still, it would be easier if ZBrush did more to guide the users, because without that, the early experience can feel isolating, especially if you're used to software that walks you through the basics.
For me personally, the first time I started learning ZBrush, I kind of learned the interface and how it works. For like one week or so. Then I came back like a couple of weeks later and I kind of forgot everything. Because generally speaking, it is not intuitive. So you have to do it for a long time to get used to it. And there you have it guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also check some of our previous videos. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.